My name is Janine Zalaki and I'm with the SELN team. I know that my colleague John Butterworth and I had the pleasure of uh, participating with many of you through our webinars on employment that we provided. Uh, it seems long ago, but that's because it was right around the start of the pandemic. So I know we all feel like it's been a long time. Um, I just wanted to make a, a few comments and then I'll turn this over to Director Angie Pina. Um, the comments I just wanted to make are that uh, Utah has made a significant, you know, DHS, the Services for People with Disabilities, has made a significant commitment to making sure that all of you support coordinators have all of the information um, and tools um, because they realize that you really have a very big impact on employment and supporting the people that you support. So with that being said, I would like to turn this mic over to Director Angela Pina to talk about some of those efforts. Angela? Thanks, Janine. Um, I just wanted to start off quickly, just start off with a little bit of a, a little bit of our history, right? Since 2011, when we became an employment first state and even before, DSPD has been emphasizing, the employment, emphasizing employment as an option for all individuals with disabilities. Um, since then, we've worked with the national experts from the Office of Disability Employment Policy, um, the Supported Employment Leadership Network, um, to improve and innovate our employment policies and practices. We've worked to support providers in transforming their services to support competitive integrated employment and have been partnering with schools to develop pathways for transition age youth leaving schools. Um, and now we've added providing information and supports to you guys, to all of our support coordinators, to give you the tools and resources that help you focus on employment. It's been through the webinars that we've done, um, the path the employment pathway tool that some of you are piloting, um, these employment shorts and the guidance for adapting supports through the pandemic to keep people focused who are interested in working or exploring employment. Um, there have definitely been challenges along the way and we've been able to work through them with the support of all of our stakeholders, people we serve, families, support coordinators, providers, the Utah State University Center, for employment and inclusion, um, and many other advocacy partners. Over the years, we've sought funding to better meet the needs of individuals. Um, and we recognize employment as a right and a choice that we need to ensure people with disabilities know they have. Um, we really appreciate your engagement with us in all of this and your commitment to people you serve and people with disabilities. Um, throughout our state, you can see how essential the role of a support coordinator is in everything that happens for a person. You're their advocate, you're assessing their services, you're, you're learning about their interests, helping them plan their future, helping them have a meaningful life. Um, and as we know, employment is a big part of most people's lives. Um, it helps us have money for what we wanna do, um, pursue our other dreams, and hopefully a job that is something that you love as well. We know that it increases health. Health outcomes are better when people are working, self-esteem, natural connections in their communities. Um, so we're really excited to have support coordinators for these past two shorts to be sharing their experiences, their supports, um, and how this has worked out for people they're serving. So thank you for being here and taking part of this important work. Thank you so much, Tina. Uh, before I turn this over to my colleague, Nancy Nicholas, I do want to just thank Aubrey and Tricia from the state, uh, the Utah State University Center for Persons with Disabilities who are supporting us in these events. Um, so we, we owe a lot of gratitude to them. Nancy? Nancy Nicholas, and I am very happy to be here with you today. I work with the Institute for Community Inclusion, and in a prior life, I was a case manager in the state of Missouri, I know the importance of the work you do. I know how busy you are. And so thank you so much for being with us today. Today, you're going to hear a short presentation from Lara Bone, a support coordinator in Utah, who will provide and share ideas and strategies for supporting people to reach their employment goals. 
We hope that the story that she tells you will inspire you and the strategies she shares will help you move forward if you're feeling stuck. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Laura in a moment, and then we're going to see a brief video of Amber's story. There is a chat pod where you can type in any thoughts, observations, or questions throughout the presentation. And after the video, we're going to address those questions and comments. You will then have an opportunity to connect and talk directly with Laura. We will do a quick wrap up and then send you on your merry way. So a little bit about Laura. Your speaker, Laura Bone, has been a support coordinator with Envision Quality Supports since June of 2011. She worked for the Division of Services for People with Disabilities and Salt Lake Act. She has also worked for Chrysalis, a DSPD provider from 1992 to 1994. Laura has a BS in Educational Psychology with a teaching certification in Severe Profound Intellectual Disabilities. She speaks Spanish fluently after living in Paraguay for 18 months. In her spare time, Lara enjoys keeping up with her husband and three kids, and she will soon be an empty nester, which I'm sure will be very difficult for her. She has two Labradoodles, which she loves spending time with, and she enjoys road biking and hiking. Today's video is titled, It's Just a Hill, Get Over It. Listen as Lara describes how this philosophy help the team persevere through multiple attempts to help Amber find the right job match. 2009, to effectively channel work and life stresses and improve my health, I started cycling and began to participate in 100 mile rides. I've ridden my road bike up a lot of hills since then. On one of those most challenging hill rides, uh, 38 miles long, my friend gave me a necklace that said, it's just a hill, get over it. This ride not only changed my perception of getting over challenges, but four years later in the fall of 2015, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. That familiar refrain still gets me through the rough days. It's just a hill, get over it. This has become my mantra and focus in looking for ways to support people in getting over their hills. I'd like to share a story about my friend Amber Amber was born with mild intellectual disabilities, but from an early age, both her parents and Amber refused to be defined by this. She graduated from high school the year I began to work at DSPD. I actually helped her receive services off the, the waiting list. I've been her caseworker since 1994, with the exception of a few years. Amber has always had exceptional family support and they have encouraged her to live her life without labels and to pursue her dreams and get over her hills. Amber has had 16 job sites that we can remember. This was not exactly the perfect discovery employment process, but rather an exercise in trial and error. Amber just knew she wanted to work. She did not find the perfect job match at age 22 or even the first time she was hired by Pizza Hut. It took her a second time in 2011 when she was 39. This time she was preparing food, prepping the dough and helping breadsticks to rise. And here she began to develop one of her passions, cooking. One of Amber's significant hills is that she struggles with depression and needs to work to have a schedule to keep her busy. She's always wanted to work, and her current employer, Pizza Hut, is a pickup and delivery location only. This means that they have never closed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Amber wears gloves and a mask, and her location environmentally has assisted her to have a space in the back of a store that allows her to not be distracted. She and her job coach primarily have had this space to themselves. Amber has a list that she receives daily from her manager that includes the breadsticks, wings, pasta, and other side menu items that she prepares. Her job coach's primary job is to transport Amber to and from work. We started out using public transportation, but inclement weather frequently caused tardiness and unnecessary requests for days off, often at the last minute. We had to brainstorm and use appropriate codes within the billable services to ensure that transportation 
was working the way that Amber needed it to. Um, building the relationship with her coaches helped Amber to increase her sense of independence and allowed the coach to back off of their task demands. This gave Amber greater autonomy in creating her daily plan. As Amber's planning team, we changed our approach about 10 years ago to wrap around supports for Amber's version of independence. While in high school, she had two high school placements at 7-Eleven and airport food service. And we accessed Voc Rehab for these placements and the next six. Following her graduation, she worked at Chili's, the University of Utah Food Service, McDonald's, and then at that point, we accessed waiver supports and supported employment. In Amber's current employment, her infinite support coaches sometimes stay to provide support and sometimes don't. They take the cue from Amber. In the past, when Amber is without employment, she gets lost in a false reality. Her employment and feeling that she is an integral part of the Pizza Hut team allows her to compartmentalize her life and feel control and success in her physical and mental health. She enjoys socializing with coworkers and coaches and loves to schedule upcoming plans with friends and family that she can look forward to. Initially, we built too much support for Amber in all the wrong environments, both in her jobs and with roommates. As a caseworker, I wanted Amber to find the perfect job and often could not predict how she would get along with coworkers and managers. Further, I couldn't predict how she might respond to their requests. Amber needs to feel part of Team Pizza Hut, and she does. She has felt valued and supported by her coworkers for the nine and a half years she has worked there. As a team, we have identified how we could be on a text chain in real time and address concerns as they occurred. We all agreed to support Team Amber and her progress in getting over those hills and finding joy in life. We had a group text in the beginning that were quite extensive and expansive, but as Amber felt confident that we could support her, she increased in her independence in all areas of her life. We supported her attending therapy from weekly to monthly and as she needs it per current challenges. Amber has always had a voice about what she wanted her life to look like. It didn't include accessing public transportation and having roommates. It did include her family, having friendships with her coaches who provide her a way to and from work, and a chance to relax and decompress prior to starting her workday and on the way home. Amber's job at Pizza Hut is her 16th place of employment. But the second opportunity, Amber and her coach changed the location of her workstation so she's not distracted by other staff or customers. Um, and she's able to focus on completing her daily list very sequentially. Job number 16 was the right combination of supports and autonomy, the secret sauce to her success. Although change in Pizza Hut management and job coaches is inevitable, Amber is the constant and has often worked longer at her store than the managers. She started her second role with Pizza Hut on April 13th, 2011, and is very proud of her yearly anniversary, celebrating nine years this year. Elon Musk said, it is possible for ordinary people to choose to be extraordinary. I suggest that each one of us can choose to be extraordinary wherever we are, whether that be Pizza Hut, our current employments, in our homes, or with others. Amber is living her best life and has chosen to get over the hills in an extraordinary way. I just love that story. Uh, and Lara, we're gonna Lara, we're gonna ask you to join us now. Um, if you can click on uh, video down in the bottom left-hand side of your screen, you can be on screen with us. Um, 
I hope that you enjoyed that story as much as we did. Uh, in a little bit, we're going to talk about a few lessons that I heard and that I learned when, when I was um, meeting with Laura and putting this together. And just to let you know, uh, her actual video and the tape we did was, was uh, had a lot more detail in it. Um, and hopefully by the conversations that we have with Laura uh, here soon, um, you, will, you will learn more. Um, right now, I'm going to turn it over to Laura. Hey, Laura, you want to say hi to the group? I can say hi. I can't figure out the video, but uh, I'm I'm able to speak. <laughs> okay, go for it. Um, so I, I actually um, have a couple of questions and comments. And one of the things, just to let you know, that Aubrey talked about was how admirable it, it is that you recognized that um, you had to kind of pull back on those supports and that you were providing too much support. Can you talk a little bit about that process and what kind of helped you uh, recognize that and how you brought the team together to kind of troubleshoot it? It was it, it centered around the transportation and how um, she would, Amber would be agitated um, if, you know, public transportation is often not you know, running as scheduled. And so she would feel frustrated. And so she would escalate in her emotions before she even got to the job site. So um, I think that when we realized that, and there are a couple of times that we had to, by default, have the coach just take her because the bus, something happened to the bus and it wasn't coming at all. And on those days, she started, she would, she would be more relaxed. She would be able to complete her work tasks easier. And all of a sudden we all started cluing into, do you know what, let's eliminate that transportation part. And um, so we tried it for a month and noticed that her emotions were more regulated, she had more success, she enjoyed her job, there were less um, emotional outbursts. And so that's when we started um, pulling back some of those supports that we had put in place. And really taking the cue from her, from what I'm hearing is, is that you're really in tune to her and, and how she was feeling and taking the cue from the person you support rather than um, kind of pushing your own thoughts and feelings off on, on them. I, I think that is um, a, a wonderful lesson. Um, the other question, and actually I had this on my list, uh, list as well, but Aubrey asked, uh, you know, you talked about 16 different jobs um, and yeah. that is quite a bit. Uh, and so how did you keep both the family as well as Amber engaged and the team and um, engaged and motivated throughout all of these years? Amber really wanted to work. She, um, she, did, she wanted to, her parents had always worked and she saw that as this is, this is what I'm gonna do in my life. And so she was always invested in finding the right job. So, and her parents were always suggesting that like, okay, so if this one doesn't work, we can find something else. And so she was always open to that. And um, I, I think that that family support and the fact that they were leaving that as an option allowed us to continue to be willing as a team to try different things. And we tried multiple, there were multiple provider agencies involved over the years. It wasn't just the employment sites. It was um, looking for relationships with providers. And when we found the combination of a job, job coaches who were invested in her and could also pull back and not be in her face constantly saying, hey, now you got to do this. Now you got to do this. When she took control of that and she felt control of that, then she flourished. You know, I I, um, I just admire that so much that you guys, that you didn't give up. Uh, and you mentioned the multiple provider agencies, the supportive family. I'm, I'm curious about um, vocational rehabilitation. I know that they were involved initially. 
How did that process work where you finally decided that um, you, it might be beneficial to, to change over to waiver services? Um, I think she would like maintain certain employments for, for the criteria amount of time for voc rehab. So they wanted to pull back as soon as they could, if she sustained it for, you know, three to six months and she was becoming more independent, they wanted to pull back. And then it seemed that shortly after that, then we'd, we'd have a, usually it was the manager would request something of Amber's. She would respond emotionally and get upset. And then that would immediately result in a termination. So we would have to go back to the drawing board. We'd access Boat Rehab again, find another placement and get through that. Um, she eventually, we um, did find a really good combination of a, a provider who was willing to just, they were like that, we're in it, we're in this, we're in this, we're Team Amber, we're, you know, it doesn't, we'll just continue to find the, the right placement. You know, um, I have to, I have to smile because um, you, you folks in Utah really, really believe in building a good team. Um, for our listeners who weren't there, or maybe weren't there for Corinne's story earlier this month, one of the things that she also talked about was was the importance of really building that great team. So yeah. there's something going on in Utah there that that is really quite lovely. Um, mm -hmm. Also, um, Trisha asked. She said um, she wanted to find out. My screen is moving on me a little bit. Um, Trisha wants to you to talk a little bit more about how you've supported Amber through all of the turnover of the coworkers and support professionals. She says it sounds like she's incredibly resilient, but she would love to learn more about how the team has helped her build that resiliency. Um, part of that is, is also the mental health component. We um, did get uh, her involved in the, the uni, the neurobehavior home program here, which is a medical home model. And, um, when we started involving, um, the psychiatrist and her counselor therapist and the job coach and the supported living staff all together. And we all started. So now on our text chain, we would be like, okay, we're having a rough day. And if we sustained those rough days for more than two weeks, then we discuss whether Amber felt like we needed to look at a medication option for her, or if we needed to, you know, increase counseling so that it was not just monthly, but weekly. Um, and we still do that. We just had a conference call on Monday, you know, so where we're, we're so in tune with what her emotional needs are. And when we can see that she's kind of starting to decline, that then we're looking in and we're, we're really collaborating to make sure that we're not, we're not tanking. We don't, we're not losing the job every time now. We're building in the supports when she's telling us she needs them. And, and I think that that collaboration, I, that is really, um, the support coordinator is kind of the captain of it, the ship when it comes to, to building and, and sustaining that collaboration. Would, do you find that to be true? In, in my experience with Amber, yes. So, um, you know, the, the staff will text me because there's a bad day. So then I'm, you know, starting the text group like, okay, what do we need to do here? Can you get her an appointment? And then we're we're immediately responding to that. And one of the things that you talked about, and, and I also had a question on it, so I'd like you to expand about it on it a little bit, is really about the health of the whole, whole person. Because part of when we when we had to decrease uh, the minutes and, and just uh, eliminate some of the great recording work that you did for us, you talked a lot about uh, her living situation as well. Yes. and how the living situation impacted that. So would you like to share a little bit about that? Sure, originally when we, um, Amber, it was decided her parents wanted her to be more independent. So we looked 
at a supervised apartment setting where she had two other roommates. Well, Amber was feeding off of their daily moods and that seemed to affect her greatly. She's, um, and so that would determine whether she wanted to get up in the morning or if she felt like she wanted to, if her roommate was having a bad day, she wanted to be the caretaker. And so she would be like, well, I can't go to work because I've got to take care of them. Or if they were upset and had done something that um, Amber was upset about, then she would also kind of carry that emotion to the next transition. So um, we spent a lot of time just dealing with those daily emotional kind of roller coasters. And, um, and Amber just said, I don't want to have roommates. I want, I want to live by myself. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to listen to somebody else's stuff. I just want to take care of my own stuff. So that was a, another transition that was difficult. But once we did that and built enough supported living hours so that she had staff there when she wanted them, also she just flourished. And then there was less drama for her to get to that work site or to, to go do what she wanted. She also started, her dream was to go to Graceland. And so we built this, you know, we kind of set things in place for her within a year and a half for her to, to go to Graceland. You know, she worked so many hours and she had sustained that and she had earned enough money that in every month we discuss that as a group. Okay, you were like, this is how much money you have. This is what you need. You're almost to Graceland. And, and even now, I mean, her next, she was, she was going to go to Hawaii, but now, now we're going to wait on that for a sec. But she's actively telling us what her next goal is. And, and that's the same for me in my life. And I think for all of us. Yeah, that is very true. We all work. Um, it's, it's wonderful to have a job that, that you enjoy and you love, but really we all work so that we can have money to do the things that we want to do. It's a great motive. Exactly. It is. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious, uh, Janine, uh, my, my comrade Janine uh, and my colleague John Butterworth are both on the line. Um, I will ask them if they had any questions that came to their mind. And we'll just Hi. give it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Hi, it's Janine. Um, Laura, you alluded to the, you know, 16 jobs. And I guess, you know, it's, it's not the same as Nancy's comment, but I, I just wanted to know if you had um, any advice, because I think what happens is a lot of times, if there isn't a good job match, um, it's, you know, the person is said to, you know, that, oh, they're not ready for a job or, you know, it's this or that. How did you really get into the real issues of what, you know, what didn't make that the right job match? And then finally to getting the right job match and staying that course, because a lot of times we have to, you know, you know, push with providers or push with teams to get over that hump. So I was just wondering if you had any comments there that would be helpful for us to learn. I, I think environmentally, you know, knowing what that she needed, just a focused area where she wasn't being distract, distracted and setting up the workstation environmentally so that that wasn't an issue was, was the best thing that we did to just set her up so that she was not distracted by other coworkers and that she could just complete her job. So, and, and that, that took us to like job 11 to figure that out, mm -hmm. you know? Yep. So yep. I think um, just looking at what can make someone successful. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. John said that he loves and appreciates the persistence and focus on listening um, and, and really putting the needs of Amber and her desires first. Uh, we are uh, running out of time for questions. Uh, so we, we are going to get started um, with our last comments. Uh, Laura, thank you so much for joining us today. We so much appreciate your time and your effort and, you, and your wonderful, wonderful story. Thank you so much. 
I'd like to spend a few minutes right now talking about some of the strategies that I think really helped the team and Amber be successful in finding and maintaining employment. First of all was the belief that the family had and an expectation for work and the fact that the team recognized how important that belief was. I think the fact that the family was so insistent that she could be successful really helped the team maintain their belief that Amber could be successful as well. The second um, is that the team never believed that, they were, that this was a one and done process. Even though Amber had 16 jobs before they found one that worked, um, they recognized that skills and desires may change as Amber's experiences grew and those skills evolved. And they had an, if you don't succeed first, try, try again attitude. I think that a lot of times we give up and this team sure didn't. They also focused on the needs of the whole person. Uh, which led to job success. They focus on the, the fact that Amber wasn't happy in the place that she was living, that she needed medical supports, and she needed therapy that uh, needed to be adjusted uh, over time so that they could continue to work on those job skills and um, maintaining a job uh, while other things were going on in her life. There was um, an incredible amount of team work on this particular story. And I really brings home the importance of Lara fulfilling her role as a support coordinator to put together and lead a really diverse team of people who were committed to Amber's success. And then after that team was built, setting a method in place to ensure that that communication between everyone who cared about Amber would be ongoing, and this was really critical. The other thing that I think they did is they adapted supports to meet the changing needs that Amber displayed. Um, and they had this attitude of, hey, if this doesn't work, then let's try something else instead. And it was this persistence and this insistence that Amber could be successful that really ultimately led to her working at Pizza Hut and a job she enjoyed with people that she enjoyed being with. Here's um, a slide that has a few resources. Uh, just to let you know, we will be um, including uh, these Corinne's video, which was November 5th, and the video here today um, on the Center for Employment and Inclusion's website. And actually, uh, that's .com slash webinars. Um, and also, you heard Utah talk about their guidance for conversations. Uh, I'm so excited you all are doing that. And But we also, at the State Employment Leadership Network through NASDAQ and ICI, have a guidance document. And if you are interested in um, seeing that um, and seeing additional shorts, from uh, support coordinators from around the country, you can find that at selnhub.org slash shorts. So that is our presentation today. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your time. Thank you, Laura and Janine and all of the folks in Utah. And I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you.